I disagree um, with the bulk of the bulge bracket banks, and I think that prices will remain um, certainly above $60 a kilogram over the next year, um, and, and could very well remain above $70 a kilogram over the next year. Everybody, welcome back. My next guest is Matt Fernley. He's the managing editor of the Battery Materials Review at batterymaterialsreview.com. Matt, welcome back. It's been uh, a while since we've seen you. I guess it was back in May 2022. And uh, since then, uh, I read today in a Chinese publication that some companies there had suspended lithium production due to environmental concerns as a result of scrutiny by the Chinese Communist government. Is that likely going to cause problems for lithium supply at this point? Uh, I mean, if, you, if you're asking about whether lithium refining potentially from hard rock is environmentally negative. Um, no, not really. Not, not when it's done correctly. Um, basically, hard rock refining um, obviously generates waste products. Um, it, it's power intensive, so obviously there, there's an issue there. Um, but um, a lot of work has gone into um, basically finding uses for those waste products and indeed you know they can go into um, building materials and and such like so um, when refining is done properly i have to be careful about my words here but when refining is done properly um, no it's not in environmentally um, impactive so i don't i don't think there's an issue from the point of view of building a u.s lithium refining industry or a north american lithium refining industry um, but there are some issues in china at the moment and and part of it's around the growth in the lithium industry so historically uh, most of lithium came from brine, and then um, over time, uh, the lithium industry developed into hard rock. And there's different types of hard rock minerals. So, spodumene is the most common uh, hard rock mineral, and that's what's being mined in Western Australia and the projects, uh, the development projects in Canada and in the east coast of the US and in Brazil and Africa, etc. Now, there's another lithium mineral called lipidolite, uh, which is mined extensively in China. And the lipidolite processing um, generates an awful lot of waste. So, um, because China is obviously desperate to source lithium, um, it's developing these lipidolite resources, which are very high cost and generate a huge amount of waste, like 10 tons of waste for each ton of, uh, of lithium carbonate or lithium hydroxide. And I think that, that that's what you're referring to, that there have been a number of environmental uh, inspections of these lipidolite processing plants in China um, because there are concerns about the, the waste. But there aren't too many lipidolite uh, processing operations outside China and certainly not in the spodumene area. Uh, are there any risks, sure. any materials? Okay, then, so since we last chatted in May, how has the progress been for the rollout of these battery factories in North America from where you sit? Well, there's this little piece of legislation called the Inflation Reduction Act, which has um, made quite a big difference, actually, um, both within North America and globally. And I, I think one of the really exciting things about the IRA is that it is catapult sorry, it's catapulted the US um, ahead of Europe in terms of development of a lithium ion battery and, and in fact, an EV industry. Um, you know, the, the Europeans were ahead. Um, there's been a lot of talking out of Europe, but, but not an awful lot of doing. Uh, and then really with the IRA and the um, funding that has become available from the, from the DOE grants, etc., um, really the, the US US has catapulted itself um, ahead of Europe in, in the race to develop an uh, EV manufacturing industry. And what's particularly uh, exciting for me about the IRA is this issue of uh, not just relying on the US um, battery supply chain, but also this issue of friendshoring. So basically, opening up Australia and Canada as sources of battery raw materials, um, which is 
very different from from the route that the Europeans have taken, um, and I, I think works very well for for the US. Um, uh, you know, with Australia and Canada, um, you basically got. Um, all of the key battery raw materials uh, can be mined, developed in those regions. And I think that's a huge uh, differentiating factor for, for the US. So, yeah, I, I mean, the IRA has totally, you know, uh, changed the playing field. And um, I think when we spoke last time, we were talking about maybe two or three cell manufacturing facilities having been um, uh, announced in the US and now we're talking about sort of 10 or 15 of them. So um, it, it's it's a real step change in the industry. Yeah, I happen to have uh, first-hand knowledge of one uh, Chinese uh, assembly line equipment manufacturer specializing in lithium-ion batteries who's actively seeking partners to build batteries for in North America, they've actually approached me and said, do I know of any companies who need batteries built for them who might be willing to invest in this? Anyway, so it's intriguing to me that uh, they are cognizant of a, um, a sort of a anti-China sentiment in North American circles, mm. and particularly in government, to the point where they're trying to create the appearance of a North American presence and have the manufacturing facilities in China just perceived as an offshore facility owned by a North American entity. Uh, do you mm. see that? I mean, it sounds to me like in Europe there's more of an overt, you know, build it in Europe, source it in Europe kind of approach, whereas North America, as you said, has opened up this idea of friendshoring in the IRA. Um, do you think that's going to affect China's ability to progress in North America, or is it going to be more partnerships? Will they be included in the friendshoring arrangement at some point? I can't see China ever being including it in the friendshoring arrangement. I mean, I think the whole uh, reason behind the the IRA is to develop, um, you know, an integrated U.S. industry. I mean, effectively, we in the Western world have spent the last twenty years outsourcing our manufacturing to China, and you know, uh, the experience of of this year and obviously the pandemic has has emphasised that it's really important to have your supply chain onshore and, and and close to you so I, I really think that the ira is um is aimed at at, at bringing everything into the us or, or certainly north america or the north american sort of environment i i can't see them being overly chuffed about um you know bringing the chinese in there and uh, you know it's noticeable for instance that in the last couple of weeks the canadian government has cracked down very hard on uh, chinese investment in in resources projects um and they've actually told chinese entities to sell um, their interest in, in, I think, three or four Chinese, um, Canadian lithium developers. So, you, you know, it's pretty, it's pretty clear politically um, that, that they're trying to say sort of, you know, uh, hands off um, to China. You, you already control a large proportion of the raw materials in the industry uh, we want to control our own supply chains. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, when we last spoke in May, we were discussing that uh, despite the commodity price being quoted on certain exchanges at $82 per ton back then, uh, or 82000 is it $82,000 per ton? Um, yeah. That the now Goldman Sachs and Credit Suisse came out with a report in November that said uh, that they doubled down, not doubled down, they refined their anticipated deficit, uh, and and yet the price continues to climb in the commodity space. But as we discussed in May, companies aren't paying the commodity price quoted on the futures exchange. They are mm -hmm. negotiated contracts, typically negotiated for one year or less, and. And uh, has those prices 
that they are negotiating changed at all in the last six months? So it's really interesting, and and the industry has again moved on considerably in the last what six six and a half months since we last spoke. So when when we last spoke, we saw a lot of um, Brian contracts um, selling into to multi year. Um, fixed price contracts. Um, since that time, we've actually seen the brine producers renegotiating a lot of their contracts. So, you know, you've had companies like Albemarle and SQM and Livent renegotiating their contracts. So now uh, we see that most contracts, probably sort of 70 to 80 percent of, of contracts in the industry, are. Um, quarterly pricing contracts which use some element of spot pricing. So they're directional contracts which are which are backwards pointing at the spot pricing in the last quarter and they'll basically go up or down according to spot pricing. So the, the spot price, even though it may be for a relatively small amount of material in the industry, although it is a growing amount of material, um, is very, very relevant for um, what these quarterly uh, contract prices are, um, and indeed, you know, in in the Australian hard rock as well, we're we're seeing that too. So we are seeing in China. I would estimate that probably fifteen or twenty percent of lithium. Um, um, volume now is trading in the spot market, which is a very big difference to sort of 12 to 18 months ago when it was probably 5 to 10 percent. So, we are definitely seeing more on the spot market in China, um, but we're also seeing um, a, a big increase in these sort of now quarterly pricing contracts, which, by the way, may very well be for you know long term volume contracts, but they're quarterly pricing, which now um, points at the spot market. Hmm. So, so, you know, there's about a quarter lag in that, but what the spot market is doing is very, very relevant to what the producers are, are going to be realizing in their revenues um, in the next couple of quarters. Sure. And so, where do you see the lithium spot price going in 2023? The $64,000 question. Well, actually, it's a bit more than that. Um, to, to tell you the truth, I'm going to uh, go down and say I disagree um, with the bulk of the bulge bracket banks, and I think that price will remain um, certainly above $60 a kilogram over the next year um, and, and could very well remain above $70 a kilogram over the next year. Uh, and that's very different to the bulk of the bulge bracket banks who are indicating that prices could fall to anywhere uh, between $11 and $25 a kilogram by the end of next year. Um, and, and, and where I differ is that I still think the bulge bracket banks, as they did this year, are overestimating the amount of supply that can come into the market. Um, you know, some of the supply estimations that were published, uh, shall we say, earlier in the year um, by some of the bulge bracket banks were wildly inaccurate. I mean, you know, in terms of ex China capacity, some of these guys were 50% out in terms of uh, the amount of capacity. They, they were forecasting double the amount of capacity that ended up coming into the market. And, I, you know, I really think that that's where. Uh, a lot of these guys are going very wrong, and that's why they're so negative on uh, an industry that, that those of us who are closer to the industry regard as as very attractive and very exciting. And you know, for for me, I also think that a lot of the bulge brackets are um, unnecessarily conservative in their long term pricing assumptions, um, and I think that uh, obviously that will be found out over the next couple of years, but I, I do think that um, long-term prices at the bulge brackets are way too low uh, compared to where they should be. Right. Okay, Matt. Well, that's a great contribution as usual. Really appreciate your input. Thank you for joining us. We'll have you back again soon. Pleasure. Pleasure.